pancreatic cancer is among the most aggressive forms of human cancer with a very high mortality rate. It represents the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the United States, with an annual mortality of 32,000 dead. With a five-year survival rate of only 3%, an average survival less than six months, diagnosis of pancreatic cancer carries one of the poorest prognoses. It's one of the worst things a doctor ever has to tell a patient. The only FDA-approved therapies for it, gemcitabine or lotinib, uh, produce objective responses in less than 10% of patients, while causing severe side effects in the majority. There's a desperate need for new options. Clinical research to test new treatments are split up into phases. Phase 1 trials are just to make sure the treatment is safe, to see how much you can give someone before it becomes toxic. Curcumin, the natural yellow pigment in the spice turmeric, has passed a number of those. In fact, there's so little toxicity, the dosing was limited only by the number of pills that patients were willing to swallow. Phase 2 is to see if it actually has any effect, and it did in two of the 21 advanced pancreatic cancer patients that were evaluated, one of whom had a 73% tumor reduction. This is what we'd like to see, before and after. Unfortunately, the effect was short-lived. This lesion remained small, but apparently a curcumin-resistant tumor clone emerged, whereas the other patient slow, showed a slow improvement over a year, stable disease for over 18 months. In fact, the only time their cancer markers bumped up was during a brief three-week stint where the curcumin was stopped. So it does seem to help some patients with pancreatic cancer, and most importantly, What's the downside? Right? No curcumin-related toxic effects, up to doses of 8 grams a day. Uh, what happens after 8? We don't know, because no one was willing to take that many pills. They were willing to go on one of the nastiest chemotherapy regimens on the planet, but didn't want to be inconvenienced with swallowing a lot of capsules. Anyway, the only surefire way to beat pancreatic cancer is to prevent it in the first place. In 2010, I profiled this study, the largest such study in history, which found that dietary fat of animal origin was associated with increased pancreatic cancer risk. But which animal fat is the worst? Well, the second largest study has since chimed in to help answer that question. Poultry was the worst. The first finding of its kind, 72% increased risk of pancreatic cancer for every 50 grams of daily poultry consumption. That's just like a quarter of a chicken breast. The reason white meat came out worse than red may be because of the cooked meat carcinogens in chicken, the, the heterocyclic amines that build up in grilled and baked chicken. These mutagenic chemicals have been associated with a doubling of pancreatic cancer risk. Other recent studies include one out of San Francisco, implicating the standard American diet, and one out of Italy. A high consumption of meat and other animal products, as well as refined carbs, was associated with pancreatic cancer risk, whereas a diet rich in fruit and vegetables appeared to lower risk. Eating meat may increase risk, whereas eating fake meat has been found associated with significantly less risk. Those who eat you know, plant-based meats, like veggie burgers and veggie dogs, three more and more times a week had less than half the risk of fatal pancreatic cancer. Legumes and dried fruit were found to be similarly protective. This landmark study, comparing the ability of different spices to suppress inflammation, also compared their ability to protect DNA. Cloves, ginger, rosemary, and turmeric were able to significantly stifle the inflammatory response, but what about DNA protection? If you take a tissue sample from some random person, around 7% of their cells may show evidence of DNA damage, actual breaks in the strands of their DNA. And if you blast those cells with free radicals, you can bring that number up to 10%. But if the person had been eating ginger for a week, that drops to just 8%. This is from a tissue sample taken from someone who hadn't been eating any herbs and spices, and as a result their cells were vulnerable to DNA damage from oxidative stress. But just including ginger in our diet may cut that damage 25%, and same with rosemary. But check out turmeric. DNA damage cut in half. Again, this is not just mixing turmeric with cells in some petri dish. This is comparing what happens when you expose the cells of spice eaters versus the cells of non-spice eaters to free radicals and just sit back and count DNA fracture rates. 
And not only did the turmeric work significantly better, but a significantly smaller dose. This is comparing about one and a third teaspoons a day of ginger or rosemary to practically just a pinch of turmeric, about an eighth of a teaspoon a day. That's how powerful the stuff is. So I encourage everyone to cook with this wonderful spice. It tastes great and may protect our cells and our body, with or without the added stress. If you just count DNA breaks in people's cells before and after a week of spices without the free radical blast, we see no significant intrinsic protection in the ginger or rosemary groups. But the turmeric groups still appear to reduce DNA damage by half. This may be because curcumin is not just itself an antioxidant, but boosts the activity of our own antioxidant enzymes. Catalase is one of the most active enzymes in the body. Each one can detoxify millions of free radicals per second. And if you consume the equivalent of about three-quarters of a teaspoon of turmeric a day, the activity of this enzyme in our bloodstream gets boosted 75%. Now, why do I suggest cooking with it, rather than just like throwing it in a smoothie? Well, this effect was found specifically for heat-treated turmeric. Uh, because in practice many herbs and spices are only consumed after cooking, they tested both turmeric and oregano in both raw and quote-unquote cooked forms. In terms of DNA damage, the results from raw turmeric did not reach statistical significance, though the opposite was found for the anti-inflammatory effects. So maybe we should eat it both ways. Practical recommendations for obtaining curcumin in the diet might be to add turmeric to sweet dishes containing cinnamon and ginger. I add it to my pumpkin pie smoothies, which are otherwise just a can of pumpkin, uh, frozen cranberries, pitted dates, uh, pumpkin pie spice, and some non-dairy milk. And also you know, cook with curry powder or turmeric itself. They also suggest something called turmeric milk, which is evidently a traditional Indian elixir made with milk, turmeric powder, and sugar. I'd suggest substituting a healthier sweetener and a healthier milk. Soy milk, for example, might have a double benefit. If you're taking the turmeric to combat inflammation, compared to dairy protein, osteoarthritis sufferers randomized to soy protein ended up with significantly improved joint range of motion. Following flax and wheatgrass, turmeric is the third best-selling botanical dietary supplement, racking up $12 million in sales, and increasing at a rate of about 20%. Curcumin is a natural plant product extracted from turmeric root, used commonly as a food additive, popular for its pleasant mild aroma and exotic yellow color, considered unlikely to cause side effects. Just because something is natural, though, doesn't necessarily mean it's not toxic. Strychnine is natural, cyanide is natural, lead, mercury, and plutonium are all elements. Can't get more natural than that. But uh, turmeric is just a plant. Plants can't be dangerous. Tell that to Socrates. In considering the validity of the widely accepted notion that complementary and alternative medicine is a safer approach to therapy, we must remind ourselves and our patients that a therapy that exerts a biological effect is, by definition, a drug and can have toxicity. It cannot be assumed that diet-derived agents will be innocuous when administered as pharmaceutical formulations at doses likely to exceed those consumed in the diet. Traditional Indian diets may include as much as a teaspoon of turmeric a day, which is the equivalent of about mm, this much fresh turmeric root. If you look at the doses of turmeric that have been used in human studies, they range from less than a sixteenth of a teaspoon a day up to about two tablespoons a day for over a month, whereas the curcumin trials have used up to the amount found in cups of the spice around a hundred times more than what curry lovers have been eating for centuries. Still without overt serious side effects in the short term at least, but if you combine both high-dose curcumin with black pepper for that 2,000% bioavailability boost, that could be like consuming the equivalent of 29 cups of turmeric a day. That kind of intake could bring peak blood levels up around here, where you start seeing some significant DNA damage, in vitro at least. So just incorporating turmeric into our cooking may be better than taking curcumin supplements, particularly during pregnancy. The only other 
contraindication uh, cited in the most recent review was the potential to trigger gallbladder pain in people with gallstones. If anything, curcumin may help protect liver function and help prevent gallstones by acting as a cholecystokinetic agent, meaning it facilitates the pumping action of the gallbladder to keep the bile from stagnating. In this study, they gave people a small dose of curcumin, about the amount found like a quarter teaspoon of turmeric, and using ultrasound were able to visualize the gallbladder squeezing down in response, with an average change in volume of about 29%. Optimally, though, you'd want to like squeeze it in half, so they repeated the experiment with different doses, and it took about 40 mg to get a 50% contraction. That's about a third of a teaspoon of turmeric every day. On one hand, that's great, totally doable. But on the other hand, I'm thinking, wow, that's some incredibly powerful stuff. Uh, what if you had a gallbladder obstruction? If you had a stone blocking your bile duct, and you eat something like that that makes your gallbladder squeeze down that hard, well, it could hurt. You know? So patients with biliary tract obstruction should be careful about consuming curcumin. But for everybody else, these results suggest that curcumin can effectively induce the gallbladder to empty, and thereby you know, reduce the risk of gallstone formation in the first place, and ultimately perhaps even gallbladder cancer. Too much turmeric, though, may increase the risk of kidney stones. As I mentioned in a previous video, uh, turmeric is high in soluble oxalates, which combine to calcium form insoluble calcium oxalate, which is responsible for approximately three-quarters of all kidney stones. So the consumption of even moderate amounts of turmeric would not be recommended for people with a tendency to form kidney stones. Such folks should restrict the consumption of total dietary oxalate to less than 40-50 mg a day, which means no more than at most a teaspoon of turmeric. So for example, those with gout are by definition, it appears, at high risk for kidney stones. And so if their doctor wanted to treat gout inflammation with high-dose turmeric, then that's where curcumin supplements might come into play, because to reach you know, high levels of curcumin in turmeric form would incur too much of an oxalate load. If one is prescribed a supplement, how do you choose? Uh, the latest review recommends purchasing from Western suppliers that follow recommended good manufacturing practices, which may decrease the likelihood of our buying a, an adulterated product.